Welcome back to SwitchCast. Tonight, we are not here live, but we appreciate you being here. And in celebration of me not being here, we're gonna show you the best of the last few years of SwitchCast. That's right, we went back through some of our favorite guests, although they were all wonderful, and some of our favorite moments from SwitchCast and put together a highlight reel for you all. So again, I know you're maybe disappointed that you can't uh, ask your questions tonight, and we're certainly disappointed as well, but unfortunately, I will not be in the country this week. It is not because I am fleeing from the law or anything. Don't worry, I will be back next week and we'll be here live, but uh, we wanted to put together our favorite moments for you. So sit back, grab a cold beer, make some pop away, and throw your our best to respond to them next week when we're back here live. So we thank you for all of your support. We enjoy your viewership, and uh, we're glad you are enjoying the podcast. Probably my favorite VinWiki car, and it was around and known before VinWiki, but it's, it's, it's chronicled now in VinWiki, is the dead rapper Murcielago, yes. which if you haven't seen it, there's this newspaper clipping of this rapper who was, uh, you know, a legitimate Dead. businessman, but he was, he was shot and he was, um, at his, uh, his open casket funeral was a, was, it was Not an open casket. door. It was an open door funeral. And, uh, yeah. So there's one photo of that and it has made the rounds of dealers and individuals and the, black and red interior has been changed out to black to somewhat erase the history and or the smell of formaldehyde but you know there's there's a definite value detraction for that car because of that but not all of the i think the current owner has no idea that he has the dead rapper mercy lago well he could if he checked vinwiki and but really until I don't, it was never advertised as that. And so someone put the pieces together and documented that on VinWiki. And I, I'll be honest, that car is worth 20% more than an average 03 Mercy today. To you. To anybody. <laughs> to you. To, all right, to it, amongst imperfect cars. I'm not saying that okay, it is absolutely. But if you were looking at the bottom third of 03 Mercies, which it certainly is within, you know, non original interior cars, things like that. Yes, it's worth more. Would you rather own the dead wrapper car or a normal one? Well, but you make money off of telling stories. No, so, I make money off selling the cars that are way more interesting to other people that want to tell the stories at Cars and Coffee. If you pull up in the car and like, <sighs> you know, oh, that's a really pretty Mercy. Guess what? A dead guy at his funeral in it. How cool is that? I mean, people love that stuff. I wonder if you could get the original newspaper clipping for that you don't car. have to you google it dead rapper mercy oh no, now ed has it. no but to like put it on your oh, friggin windshield i'd, I'd wrap it in that just tiled over i mean like, <laughs> like if, absolutely i mean the first thing i would do is put the interior back to original and get a stuffed version of that guy to put in that cars and coffee if you had, uh, absolutely i mean he would ride with me in the hov lane i mean uh, the whole time that uh, it's the new like people people are getting desperate for attention at cars and coffee now because paint to sample has become ubiquitous so it's like well, what do i do <laughs> ed you've you've created an entire new market for weird story cars that <laughs> it's the new we need to it's find the new them. flex that's it that's it <laughs> yeah, that that car was up for auction on on double clutch the wholesale website I, I sent it to you. It was like six months ago or a year ago. I mean, it wasn't super recent, but the guy wanted all the money. It, it's in Ohio. He knows what he's got. Uh, based on what he paid for it, I don't know if he did, but yeah, it's in it's, Ohio. It is. Yeah. yeah, it is in Ohio. So. Yeah. They, they, there are these people that make really realistic looking dolls, and I'm sure they could do the rapper. <laughs> I don't know those people, but I'm sure you do. I don't want to ask why you know those people. I just know they exist. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you also have their W9? Nope. No, they're not a sponsor. <laughs> they're not a sponsor. I said W9. Their W9. How much have you paid to uh, them? The, uh, no, I, I didn't say 1099. He's, uh, he's not an accountant. Don't, don't think this is advice. <laughs> I didn't give advice. I'm asking you questions. Well, about the responsibility of my purchases. Is that it? For some of you watching, 
our last episode was live from California at the Portofino Hotel, which is the traditional finish line of the original Cannonball Run and what we use now as well as the finish line for our runs. And we did a musket ball, which was limited to 100 horsepower at the wheels. We all met in Darien, Connecticut and had to dyno our cars. And if we were over 100 horsepower, we had an uh, insignificant penalty. But some depends. extra weight. <laughs> there was some maybe a live yeah. lobster had yeah. to do a puzzle yeah. overnight, things yeah, like yeah. that. So uh, Steve was well within the rules of 100 horsepower. Oh, yeah, yeah. What did you take on this run? <laughs> on that run, I, I bought a 1997 Saturn SL2. So it's the yes. basic four door plastic racer. Oh yeah, that dent resistant panels <laughs> from our top scientist. Yep. Um, so yeah, that that was it was actually a fun car. Um, the problem was, uh, with it, it doesn't have overdrive cause it's an automatic. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I had picked it because so it had a cruise control four speed. Yeah. It's a four speed automatic oh, gosh. in those cars. And so, you know, it's like any other competitive event, you know, I'm thinking I've solved the puzzle. I've figured this out. The Saturns, you know, they're there. You can't kill them. So I'm like, this, this thing can really make it. And then, of course, when I see what everyone else brought, the Saturn was way, <laughs> you know, undermatched compared sure. to these other cars. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, tell us, we got to talk to you for like four and a quarter minutes, which is about <laughs> yeah. the time that takes Arnie and I to fill up 60 gallons of fuel. <laughs> yeah. We got to talk to you briefly about your experience on the musket ball. Mm -hmm. And of course, the most notable experience being your time airborne. Tell us a little more about your yeah. experience. Yeah, that, that was really unexpected as any airborne <laughs> incident with the vehicle <laughs> is. But um, so the, the quirky thing is uh, that it's, it's this glorious shade of 1990s kind of tealish seafoam green mm -hmm. car. And so uh, for our team name for John Ficarra, uh, it was called the Flying Pistachio. So that was the solo <laughs> team name for this car. Little did I know it would become accurate. And so <laughs> we're, we're going across the U.S. Um, I get to Oklahoma and I've got to make a fuel stop. And we're on the tollway and there's those Oasis, you know, gas mm -hmm. stations like we've got up here uh, in Chicago and on the turnpike here. And so it was kind of an unexpected fuel stop because I, I, I was chasing um, some guys in a, a, a TDI Jetta and uh, it was actually Wesley who I had chased in the uh, the Southern Classic and so I just had the Saturn pegged <laughs> across the tollway in the middle of the night. So, so this is and not a leisurely drive. It, no, it was it was spirited, you spirited. Know, within the confines of a 1997 right. Saturn <laughs> automatic. But if you get ahead of him you gain a position. Yes. It is racing yes. on public it, it, highways. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. You know, it is a, a, a competition yep. to see who can get there first. And so, you know, the, the little car ran like a train and, but of course I just had it pegged uh, across uh, that part of the country. So I was, I was burning gas faster than I expected. And that car with a, it had a, a 20 gallon cell in the trunk so I could refuel it by myself in less than five minutes. And so I was like, no big deal. I've just got to make a fifth stop. You know, I, I'll just, I'll just take care of that here in Oklahoma. Got to make an unexpected stop and mm -hmm. see the sign for the, uh, the Oasis start to pull off. It was one of those left-hand exits and pitch black you know, where the exit is, but you could see the bright white lights of the gas station in the, the middle of the turnpike. And so I get off the, the exit and I've actually had to go back onto Google maps and look at this to understand what really happened. And it, it makes sense if you look, uh, at that, uh, satellite view of the, uh, the Oasis. And so basically I come off on the left exit, I overshoot the car entrance, you know, cause I just didn't see it. And so I end up on the truck side of this, uh, of this, uh, gas station. And, but I know I've got to get, you know, further in to, to of course get to the gas. And so there's this line of like 40 trucks that I've got to go past and then figure out how to weave around. And I wasn't going unreasonably fast. I was going faster than you normally would in a parking sure. lot. Cause it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm just trying to scoot through and, and uh, make a quick pit stop. So I get past there's no this speed room. limits on off. No. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, you know, it wasn't posted. Right. So make it past this row of trucks. I get to the last trailer that I can see. Um, it's a flatbed, so I can see that there's no buildings or anything in front of it. 
and I just whip the wheel to the left. And unbeknownst to me, there's this concrete <laughs> island that's there to separate traffic out of the, the truck area and just instantaneously just this loud bang. And things started to float up in the car from the seats. Things start flying through the air. I knew that the front wheels had come off the ground because it was kind of a full moon that night. And all of a sudden, the moon is in the windshield. It's not supposed to be there, right? The moon was above me in Texas. And so, pow, the car just comes up. I feel the front wheels come off. Gatorade bottles and whatnot are flying around in the the cabin. Hopefully you had your cap on your pee bottle, right? Uh, Yeah, no, there was no risk of that. I was good. I was good. And so, you know, it kind of makes this pop, goes up in the air. Then I feel the front wheels slam down. And then almost instantaneously, I had cleared the concrete island. And so the front wheels drop off and I just hear the frame drag across the island. And then uh, right after that, I went right to the gas pumps where I was supposed to go. And just so, sliding in, like just kind of slide in, and, learn hard stuff. Yeah, there it is. And so I kind of popped out, did a little ta da, and <laughs> luckily there was no one around. Like I said, it was like three o'clock in the morning. I planned that. Yeah, yeah, completely went as planned. And so I hop out, and the you know the car didn't shut off, so you know the engine was still running. Shut the car off, pop the trunk, dump fuel in it, pop the hood, looked in the engine bay, checked the oil. Um, everything in the engine bay was where it was supposed to be. And I walked around the car. None of the tires were flat. I think what really saved the front end of the car is because it was four speed, I ran taller tires to lower Mm -hmm. the RPMs uh, on the highway. So I think that's what saved the front bumper because now look, the front bumpers there, everything's fine. I just did kind of a quick glance under the car. I didn't see anything hanging off the bottom of it. So finish the fuel stop, start the car. It starts back up. The headlights come back on, start to ease out of the parking lot, turn the steering wheel. There's no noises. Nothing's grinding. Get onto the entrance ramp, actually take my hands off the steering wheel and the car's tracking straight. So somehow a miracle in my mind has happened that, you know, I didn't completely trash the car in Oklahoma. So then I take off uh, back onto the interstate and run about another 800 miles. And that's when I got to Kingman, Arizona. And what I didn't know had happened to the car is, uh, if you're familiar with the Saturns at all, they have that uh, front stabilizer bar that goes around the front. It bolts to the frame and then actually goes uh, into the control arms with some bushings. I had sheared the bolts off (laughs) of the the stabilizer bar. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then actually cracked the uh, threaded end where it goes into the, the control arm. Well, as some kind of miracle. I ran 800 miles further at the top end of a 97 Saturn's performance, which is like 80 uh, miles an hour. Yeah. You know, (laughs) downhill. Yeah. It was pretty quick and a cross flag staff and I end up for making a last fuel stop in Kingman, Arizona stopped. Same thing. Fueled the car, checked it out, got back into uh, traffic on the interstate, brushed the brakes and everything broke loose on the driver's side. Finally, the, the control arm had, had just, uh, the control bar had just, or the stabilizer bar had just snapped mm-hmm. and, and everything came apart and the car just, um, just was not drivable. You know, as I got to the second Kingman exit and I pulled it off and had to figure out what I was going to do from there. So what did you do? <laughs> so, because in cannonball, you can never give up. No, that's right. That's right. So it was like five o'clock in the afternoon and things are just starting to shut down. And so the first thing I did is, is got on my phone found a repair shop because I knew the car wasn't going to get fixed today. Like Mm -hmm. I could see the parts hanging off the bottom. I'm like, that's not going to be a roadside fix. So I found a Bradley. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Unless you're Bradley who can absolutely take care of that. But, um, found a repair shop. Uh, guy said, yeah, I'll take a look at it tomorrow. Um, found a tow truck, uh, got him coming. Um, then I knew I needed to get to LA because, you know, we're five hours out of LA now. And, and I knew that we were going to have some events and some, you know, celebrations, but I knew the car wasn't going to make it that day, Mm -hmm. honestly, or tomorrow. So got the tow truck coming, got the car, uh, sent over to the shop. And then, uh, I, I was looking for a rental car. So enterprise was the only thing listed in town called them. Guy says, look, I don't have any cars you know, we're getting ready to close. So I asked him, does anybody rent a car in this town? 
And he goes, well, yeah, there's this, you know, used car lot. It's kind of like this buy here, pay here place. And he said, you know, she'll rent cars sometimes. You can give her a call. And so I would pull it up they on Google. They will do anything. Yeah. I think they would dollars. actually transact in any way you wanted to. And so. Well, the, the, probably your rental. How long did you have the car? Two days? Two days. So yeah. that's probably, a, you know. About as long as some of their average customers, you know, <laughs> probably <laughs> before they get repoed, probably before some of the sales <laughs> come back. Um, so luckily they, they were open until six and this, this lovely young lady answers the phone, tell her my situation. I was like, look, I have to get to Los Angeles tonight. Can you help me? And she goes, sure. I'll rent you a car. Now we didn't specify what car was going to be rented. She said, I will get you a car to Los Angeles. So I catch a cab, takes me to this lot you know, show up and she's pulling up like a rental contract on word, show her a picture of my insurance card on my phone. And, uh, she goes, yep, got a car for you. She mentioned the price. I think it was like, you know, a hundred, a hundred and some change a day. I didn't care at that point. It was sure. like, just get me in the car. Yeah. Cause <laughs> yeah. at this point we're still racing. We're, we're this still is like, what people need to understand. Yeah. Even if you break, yeah, it, the race is not over. Cause that's right. Especially in a hundred horsepower race, yeah. a lot of other people have broken. So you, you want to be the first of the broken. Yes. People. Yes. Like I, and, and we're, if we're carrying apps that are showing us all the dots going across the country. And yeah. I, even though I had no chance of winning, I was a solid mid pack car mm-hmm. at this point. So you, to your point, like I've got, I've got to go. Yeah. The first and, of um, the losers. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, she kind of, we get this contract settled out and she slides these keys over and it's a, a Nissan Altima. It, which I saw Do, Nissan. Okay. I thought, that's okay. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. I got to stop you. I didn't think of this earlier, but somebody sent me, this is going to be totally lost yeah. because unless you see the montage, it doesn't make a difference. But somebody sent me like two days ago, this Instagram montage of Nissan Altimas and all the things you can do in Nissan Altimas. And it was all these crazy police chases and like car wrecks where people wrecked in an Altima and then just kept driving. And it was just saying like how amazing the Nissan Altima was in this incredibly weird ghetto way because <laughs> yeah. it, there's all these police chases where they get out of, you know, you got three Tahoes surrounding them and the Altima just I, goes I, right through. So it's funny I, that you uh, contributed to that. I promise you this Altima had been in one of those videos. <laughs> this, 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 this car had been chased by the police at some point. And um, which again, I was, you know, thankful for whatever I could get, but you know, I get in it and the seats are all kind of jacked up and you know, it's got 97,000 miles on it really bad vibration in the front kind of spell smells like hot pockets and regret on the inside. You know, there's some stains going on inside. It, it had no gas in it. And you know, Monica so Lewinsky it, yeah, was in the car. It was, it, the car had a story that I was oh, not gosh. interested in, uh, on that night. And so take off, uh, get going and, uh, make it to Los Angeles, um, about 10 30 that evening. And, and I think, I think I came in only about like 10 minutes or so before you guys did. Well, that's, so I'm looking at my notes and it says that you finished in 39 hours and 37 mm-hmm. minutes, which yeah. I think was our, I thought that was our exact time. I don't remember because it wasn't first. So it becomes a blur, mm-hmm. but I remember pulling in, taking a picture and maybe we didn't notice a dilapidated Nissan Altima flying in behind you us. Probably or something, wouldn't but notice it. it was I not. think we finished at the same time. So, yeah, I think I, because I got in, we took pictures and I parked the car because security came over and wanted yep. us to move it. And I parked it when I walked back to the guard shack and the sign you guys were coming in. So it was interesting within minutes. And actually, because we didn't really post official times, I, I had to find a calculator on the internet to figure right. out start time for that. So, but it, I, I got, there I think right it's interesting just did. because like we all started in Connecticut at the mm-hmm. same time we did a Lamas yeah. style start, which was the dumbest and most amazing thing <laughs> ever. Yeah. 25 people running to their turds yeah. and then peeling out of there. Yeah. The, the worst driving we ever did was in the first quarter of a mile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And 2,800 miles later, breakdowns, rental cars, all yeah. this drama, you know, we were broken down for eight hours and we finished within minutes of each other. Yeah, I think that's super cool. But but I'll tell you the thing. I mean, it shows how strong of a car that you guys had because I, I calculate I lost two and a half to three hours mm-hmm. of downtime and then just came in just ahead of you. I mean, so you guys had a pretty powerful run 
going, you know, yeah. if you hadn't had mechanical Yeah, we trouble. were down seven, eight hours. But yeah, yeah it, it's, that's the cool thing about cannonballing because yeah. if the delays hadn't happened to the lead, I mean, there some guys went northern route, some guys went southern route. If the big delays hadn't happened, it would have been a photo finish. Like we would have all came together in Barstow oh, yeah. and there would have been yeah. like four people racing for yeah. the photo finish. Yeah, absolutely. So. And, and I'll tell you the coolest thing about it and, and about that community I remember when I I, I kind of decided, okay, I can't fix the car on the uh, side of the road. I sent a message in that app that we were using, you know, just said, look, I'm down, you know, because yep. people would see the dots not moving. And immediately, you know, there was responses from other teams. And, and it, again, immediately, Jared Pink and the, the short bus team, they, they were kind of collecting people as needed <laughs> that were down. It was immediate. Do you need a ride? Where are you? We will come get you. Do you need help? And these people were carrying tools and, and ready to do whatever. Yep. And that's actually, you know, we talk a lot about competition and, and it's a race. But, you know, it was just that community of people that were ready to help. Yes. at a moment's notice yeah. you know it was spirit really a, of cannibal yeah across the country journey yep. and we were all there to help each other unless you're in first then you ain't stopping it, then anyway. yeah yeah you're on your own <laughs> celebrity machines is a proud sponsor of switchcast celebrity machines offers more than 250 different screen accurate license plates as they appeared in movies and tv shows like back to the future ghostbusters the fast and the furious breaking bad and so many more Celebrity Machines also makes our dealer insert plates as well as our commemorative 2539 plates from the fastest cannonball run ever. If you're looking for a gift for somebody you like or for garage art for your own place, check out CelebrityMachines.com for more info and use promo code SWITCHCAST for a 25.39% discount at checkout. Again, Go to CelebrityMachines.com and use discount code SWITCHCAST. Man hospitalized after mistaking NOS Octane Booster Racing Formula for energy drink. It's pronounced NOS, bro. No. NOS. <laughs> no, this did not happen. It, di- it did happen. No. It Can I, I love the like sub headline of the article you yes, sent me. He- <laughs> He did not receive the horsepower boost promised by the packaging. <laughs> oh, who wrote that? <laughs> oh, there's some great lines in here. Oh, uh, my What gosh. I want to know, did he really mistake it or was he thinking like, oh, maybe this will be like the purple pill in <laughs> liquid form? <laughs> and he just couldn't admit it. So he said, oops. Yeah, he drank a big bottle of this, not just a sip, believing it to be an energy drink. The 54-year-old man mm. showed up at the ER after experiencing seizures and a state of agitation. Well, that happens to me with an energy drink too. I get extremely agitated. Um, His girlfriend brought the empty bottle and reported that he drank the product, believing it to be an energy drink. I, this doesn't add up. 54 year old dude with a girlfriend chugs. This thing doesn't realize that it's not an energy drink until he starts having seizures. I mean, to be fair, energy drinks taste like garbage anyway, so I don't know what you'd expect if you didn't know any better. I guess. I don't know. I I can't I can't drink them either way. But These uh, bottles do look eerily similar. Well, they do. I'll, they, I'll, they, I'll give them that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can uh, gotta throw them a bone put them in your eclipse them. and cause some danger to manifold. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Poor guy. That's terrible. I mean, uh, don't knock it unless you try it. On a, reading this article too, like some of the side effects are terrifying, like Parkinsonian symptoms due to oxidative damage in the mitochondria of the basal ganglia. I don't know what half of that whoa, was, but whoa, it sounds whoa. terrifying. <laughs> One of those is the powerhouse of the cell. That's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Manganese poisoning, pulmonary toxicity, renal and hepatic toxicity i don't like that word renal yeah, yeah. That's not, that's not a fan i don't know what it means, but it's used but. in farming vehicles for its anti-knock properties anyway yeah that's uh don't try this at home uh shill bidding on bring a trailer p car market any auction is totally against their rules and i think it's bad anyway like why would you do that right let the auction play out I'm going to slightly implicate myself in this, but I'm not because we had no participation in it, but haters are going to hate anyway. We have a Mercedes G63 for sale. It is currently for sale on our website. 
even though it sold three weeks ago on Bring a Trailer. How would that be? Hmm. Well, we put it on Bring a Trailer with a reserve of $90,000. To make a really long story short, well, let me give you a little bit of background. On Bring a Trailer and PCAR Market, if the high bid is within 5% of the reserve, then the auction house will mark it as sold and then they will pay the seller the difference out of their buyer fee because they would rather take a skinny or take a zero and show the car is sold than to have a no sale. Right, so they, that's right in their policies. It's common practice. If you sign up as a buyer or seller, like you know this. So we had a reserve of ninety grand, and we're watching the auction. Watching the auction, we had met with a seller. The car, the G sixty three, was on consignment, so we're selling it for somebody else. And we had met with them earlier in the day. They wanted to lower the reserve to eighty five. I said okay. Then they decided not to. We were back and forth on this. So I said, no, just let the auction play out. Let's see how it goes. Well, sitting at 80 grand right until the final moments, which is typically when everyone bids, 81, 81, 5, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86. Now I'm looking at it going, okay, 86, 86 times 1.05 is 90,300. So it's going to sell. We're good. Like bring a trailer, we'll cut us back a check for the difference. 86 sits at 86 counts down it sells i'm like all right cool well not the result we wanted but it doesn't matter we still get 90 grand which was our reserve so i text the seller and said hey man congrats it sold like don't worry because if you see it sold at 86 like you're still getting 90 because bring a trailer will make up the difference we get the email i then go check the email from bring a trailer congratulations your item auction is sold the seller name is, and I, or sorry, the buyer name is, and I looked at, I couldn't believe my eyes. It's the same dude. It was the same dude. Oh. The guy consigning the car. And I texted him, I'm like, <laughs> what the frick? <laughs> <laughs> he won his own freaking car. I'm like, how do you not know this? And he's like, what happened, man? I'm like, how did I, I don't get it. Like, what, why they charge my card? I'm like, bro. <laughs> They make up the difference. You more like it's in the, the bitter contract. I'm like, uh, he's like, so are you gonna like what do we do now? Can you just sell it to the underbidder? I'm like, I don't know who it was. He goes, Well, yeah, me and another dealer friend of mine were bidding it up. I'm like, so the underbidder is your guy too? I'm like, come on, man. Like, you're gonna get me banned from bring a trailer. They're gonna think I'm in on this. Oh god. And I'm like screenshotting all the text for the inevitable, you know, deposition right? <laughs> to use a, a Toby Flenderson oh. quote. Uh, I'm like, come on, man. Are you kidding me? So, yeah. So it, then he asked me, he's like, so the 40, they charged my card 4,300 bucks. He's like, are you going to take care of that with bring a trailer? Like, are you going to figure it out? I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm on their side. It's me and bring a trailer against you, man. Oh, so... He, he paid $4,300 to not sell his car on Bring a Trailer. Oh, <laughs> and it's God. still for sale. <laughs> oh, oh it's too good. But after a time, I decided I want to become a police officer. So, uh, why I always, in the world would you I, want I don't to do know. that? I can't, I, I can't tell you why. I wish I had a really good story like TJ Hooker inspired me or one of those great cop shows. I loved Columbo. But really, it just seemed like something I wanted to do, and I did. Uh, so I was able to get a job. But back then, in the late 80s, when I became a cop, you, you literally vied for positions with 200 other people for one job. It was crazy. So it was very difficult. So you had to become a part-time cop, learn the trade as a reserve officer in Maine, and then hopefully get a full-time job, which it worked out for me. And I stayed at Hamden PD for almost 10 years. And then I went to Bangor PD in uh, 1997 and uh, worked my way through the ranks, became a detective, an investigator, polygraph examiner, and uh, had some great cases, did a lot of homicides, child abuse, polygraph examinations. And, uh, you know, one thing a cop does a lot is write. <laughs> so I suppose <laughs> yeah. that I, I was, I honed my, my skills by writing reports. And I used to like to, add a little pizzazz to the reports and sometimes they'd get sent back and that's too much pizzazz 
So I just kind of tempered it and had a good time with it. But I, I always enjoy writing a, a good line, even though, you know, related to the crime. But I'd like to, you know, I wrote them kind of humorous. If there was something humorous, I made sure I quoted people a lot. And a lot of cops in those days weren't quoting people. But I was like, hey, put quotes. If they say that, I'm putting it in the report. So, <laughs> so And who knows what meth heads will say, right? It, it, yeah, absolutely. People say some great things and they need to be quoted. So I did that a lot. And it kind of made it fun, I think, for juries. <laughs> and I uh, had a really good conviction rate and a good confession rate because I, I could speak to people and treat them fairly and kind and they tell me they killed people and that's really you know if they'd admitted they killed people i win so um that's where i came to be and over the time finally and i decided it was probably time to become a co or a commanding officer um just because i was getting older and it seemed like maybe i should try that sergeant thing so i went for a sergeant i was able to get it and the only position open was pio public information officer and uh so I took that job, and Facebook came with PIO. So they said, you can update the Facebook page. I said, I don't even have a Facebook page. That was in, 0, in 14. Um, so I took over the Facebook page, and I could see that it was absolutely boring to read. And I said, let's make this fun. And I'm going to write some things. And the chief said to me, no religion, no politics. Have, have fun with it and don't get me sued. So, I, I, <laughs> isn't that, I mean, isn't I, that kind of your job every time I mean, you get into a patrol yeah, yeah, car? Don't get us sued. <laughs> uh, and I, I know some cops can't handle that, but I was able to get through it without. I've had a few lawsuits and, and most were, you know, summary judgments and thrown out. So, thankfully for that. Um, but that's how I became a writer for the Facebook page. Insane. That's good. But, well, it's, it's, it was, there's a lot of things in between. Of course, we don't have a lot of time, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But, but, you know, over time, I just sort of ended up, I always said to guys that were young cops, female or otherwise, I'd say, pick a rock, cross the stream this way. Don't feel like you got to jump all the way across. Look for a dry rock, jump on it, and stay there for a while. Try something, then go somewhere else till you get across the stream to where you want to be. I think a lot of people come in now, officers come in. And they're like, I want to be a detective. Well, that takes, you know, you're going to be on the road 10 years. Television has destroyed any hope of common sense in society. So they're like, well, you're a you know, CSI. Well, you no, know, you're not. You're a patrol officer. You're doing patrol officer function until you learn the trade and learn how to talk to people. So it takes some time to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did my time in the hole and crawled out of it <laughs> and here i am at your place <laughs> so that's it you glamorous know? yeah no i so far i'd like i'd like to tell you it was but it wasn't and uh, uh yeah i was referring to the the, the being oh, at our probably, place yeah 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 no, this is great the yeah. height of height of success right sure. here yeah. um you, you said something that i found interesting you said that back in the 80s there's 200 guys vying for one job yes and that is seems to be at least in the departments in ohio the exact opposite <laughs> yeah right now to where our local department will hire guys who haven't even been through police academy sure they'll just say you're hired and we'll we'll, we'll send you send you we'll sort out the right. training later they're yes. so desperate for it's desperate everywhere and even in maine whereas we used to have well the, the test i took to get to bangor pd there were two nights of testing for three jobs and there were 200 to 250 each night at a local junior high to take the test to become a cop. Now, we don't have a test because we look at education and their background and things like that, but we bring them in for an oral board first. We talked, if we could get, if we could get two or three in each process, meaning two or three to put in, and we could get one out of every two processes, we'd be on our way to some success, but that doesn't happen mm -hmm. because the background, it seems to me that a lot of people do a lot of things when they're younger that we didn't do when we were younger because we were, had some fear of our father or the cops, <laughs> local cops, right? But it seems like they try a lot of different things, what, whatever it may be, and then they realize, hey, I guess you're right. I shouldn't have done that. So that washes out a lot of people. Sure. Um, not to say that some dabbling in things is a problem because we don't expect perfection, but we certainly don't hire saints or angels either because I'm not one. But – some people carried it a bit too far. Sure. And they're like two uh, two hours into it, they're like, you know, I think I'd like to be a cop now. I'm going to stop selling cocaine <laughs> and I'll apply for a job. And that doesn't work that way. Right. And it's difficult to really get somebody in there. So it's it's just difficult to find candidates that really are serious about 
getting into it and i don't blame them now this is a different time you know yeah um, i'm not sure i would jump into law enforcement if i was in this era you know in a young person i don't think i probably would but you know, you know here yeah. i am finishing up so it's okay do you, do you think uh cannonballing notoriety would uh prohibit I, somebody nope, from being I think a cop that you would probably do really well in the evoc <laughs> course you know where the, you know the emergency vehicle operation course you'd do fine um i i we'd take it as a matter of fact you, i'll drive you back there right now we'll get you in a uniform by tomorrow can I just do the driver training and skip the rest of it? You know what? <laughs> hey, if that's you know, at some point we'll probably take it just for that, just to be a driver. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I don't think it would be a real big problem. You'd probably have some things to answer to about, you know, certain questions you may have to answer honestly. How fast were you going on the trip? Or you know, it was did you break any laws on the way? And I suppose if you're honest, you'd have to say yes to both. And uh, allegedly, alleged. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not I wasn't this charged isn't a with anything. You were never caught for anything. Right. So you can't be charged <laughs> if you're not caught. So um, no, I don't think that would be a big problem. That's not. I mean, that's pretty mild stuff now. You know, driving yeah. fast across the country. Uh, yeah. Most of us would be just jealous of, of you <laughs> being able to do it. Last week we read a crazy attempt at negotiations from a prince greetings and salutations my brother in christ i trust all is well with you and your family i write to you in search of a modest yet spectacular <laughs> in search of a modest yet spectacular vessel fit for me to minister and conduct the what? wonderful works of our lord and savior jesus christ <laughs> why sir a ferrari would be a fine vehicle for that scam <laughs> Somebody offered me uh, $60,000 for a $115,000 car um, and said that they needed it to be their, uh, God had told them that it was their chariot of choice to, you know, to proclaim the works of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, it was ministry mobile. So we found, Arnob once again, found this guy's website. (laughs) He is a, uh, uh, a writer a uh, motivational speaker, a model, it looks like, and an Olympic hopeful. Uh, his huh. He's a worldwide best-selling author, and you can find his books on Amazon, The Mob Redestined Effect. Volume 2 has one rating on Amazon of one star. We kind of got to buy every these, don't we? Claim to be best selling. Uh, you can buy it brand new for a hundred dollars, or there are five <laughs> used from four dollars and seventy five cents. Oh, I think we've made enough in super chats to make this happen, boys. We got to start a book club. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no, we can't do that to brother. What was his name, brother Thomas? Or uh, no, no, no. He was referring to. Our guy is Brother Thomas. This is Mobbery Destined. Oh man. Oh, that's boy. some that's worse resale value than a Mercedes AMG from the nineties. <laughs> that's depreciation. Oh, it's free Good on golly. Kindle. Free Hold on Kindle, you say? I do say. Wait, well. wait, but but there's more. The Mob Redestined Effect Volume 3 has three ratings and he's up to 2.8 stars. Hey. Uh oh. Oh, this is great. Um, From the review from a gullible tourist, not everything that shines is gold. I had hoped for an inspiring read. I forced myself to read amateur writing and inconsistent weird stories about the author's time in university. A bit (laughs) vulgar. Not recommended. But the five star was, I read this book and I have become so enlightened I'm floating. I can't touch the ground. Please send help. The <laughs> ceiling fan is drawing me ever nearer. <laughs> oh, we need a book club, guys. I want to read these. <laughs> oh, that's a great uh, review. Guys, uh, yeah. At re- viewers here, you can go on uh, Amazon. <laughs> the Mobry Destined Effect. Uh <laughs> This is this is the guy that is there a volume one? Uh, I hope not. That oh, would be so if he just started funny. With two. That would be so great. <laughs> Everyone's perpetually <laughs> looking for volume one. <laughs> Can't find it nowhere. Oh man! So this is this guy is not going to be buying my Ferrari to to proclaim the gospel of of his Lord and Savior Jesus is he Christ. Even like, does he even say he's like a pastor or ordained or anything? Like that's not a part uh, of his bio. Brand? Let's see. 
He's a Ghanaian prince, singer, dancer, songwriter, <laughs> top model, the 2X best-selling all. author, actor, and Olympic hopeful. <laughs> He's also a humanitarian, the founder of the Mabry Destin Foundation, and the author of the inspirational book series, The Mabry Destin Effect, The Journey to the Kingdom of Heaven. Mm. Guys, okay. guys right. there's an Instagram. Oh, here we go. Here uh, we go. Ethan, you better put that link in the episode description. <laughs> yeah. The mob so does. Arnob found him. Uh, he's. Uh, I can't find the link, but Arnob found somewhere that he was asking for sponsorship. And when you go on the sponsorship page, there's like options for amounts. The default amount when you land on the sponsorship page. Anyone want to guess it? Mm. $100. That was, that was probably one hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> the minimum amount is a thousand. The maximum default is nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. <laughs> he apparently sold over a quarter million dollars in books at some point. No, to his mom. And he's I, he's posted some boxsters that I think he might have. Is owned it a at yellow boxster? Yeah. Yes, that's the one that oh, he bought from really? Porsche Beachwood. Yes. So that's like oh, that's how we came across this guy yeah. originally. Is in, he had inquired on that? His offer was quite a bit more reasonable than half price that he offered on the Ferrari. But um, he uh, put a black plate with yellow lettering that said Prince Mabry on it on the front. It's amazing. That's and hashtag manifest through Jesus Christ as he's sitting in it with a shirt off. <laughs> this is a vibe. <laughs> what, what's the Instagram handle? He's going to uh, get like, it's just mob redestined mob redestined. All right, everybody head over to at mob redestined. Don't troll him. Don't troll him. Just, just follow him. Give him, give him a boost. Give him a boost. Uh, oh, he says two time best selling author. Where is volume one? <laughs> we'll we never know. know. No, volume two and volume three are the best selling. Uh, ones. Volume one has to exist. <laughs> it's a it's a great marketing tactic, though. It's, it's brilliant. Sink people into it's your, when you, uh, when you start a business. Your first invoice is like two thousand three hundred forty two. To start exactly exactly yeah. start strong make them know that you've done this before it's not your first rodeo it's your second turns out for this guy <laughs> switchcast is brought to you by boxcast boxcast is a live streaming company based in cleveland ohio and they serve broadcasters and viewers around the world their founders launched BoxCast back in 2013 with one purpose, to make people part of the experience. If you're looking to live stream your podcast, church service, car show, sporting event, your wedding, or even your cannonball attempt, BoxCast is an easy, flexible live streaming platform for organizations and individuals. BoxCast is so easy, we're broadcasting this from a phone. Head over to switchcars.com slash boxcast for your free trial. Again, it's switchcars.com slash boxcast for your free trial. Uh, yes, August 12th at the Valley View Recreation Club, the annual nude car show. That's right. This is a thing. The Valley View Recreation Club is a small rustic nudist club. I don't know what a rustic nudist <laughs> is, but... <laughs> uh and it is not clothing optional so it's mandatory oh yeah right it's comfortably conceived odd choice of words and designed for people who desire an escape from the pressures and pretensions of everyday life i I mean clothes are not that high pressure (laughs) Like, this isn't Valley View, Ohio, is it? No, this okay. is up in oh, Wisconsin. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> Ethan wants to go. <laughs> That's what he's saying right now. Oh my right gosh. in your backyard. But I feel like, you know, it's like a nude beach, right? Which I've never been to. But people that tell me, right? Like everybody thinks like, oh, it's a bunch of like beautiful women. You go there and just, you know. But this is like, it's a car show. This, this isn't going to be a nude car show. It's going to be a dude car show. There's like, going to be a bunch of guys like Ethan <laughs> driving their cross cabs nude into this car show <laughs> tops down. Well, but like, how do you get there? You you got to go nude. Like Aaron doesn't even like wearing shorts and leather seats. What about those old mu- muscle cars with black vinyl? Mm. I mean, talk Ooh, about like, some fried uh, ball burn. Yeah. Ball burn. Yeah, <laughs> singe the hairs down there. 
some chestnuts roasting over the <laughs> black interior. <laughs> it's good. Well, not chestnuts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, Tyler, if you took your 996 there, you know, if they mentioned fried eggs, they wouldn't be talking about your headlights. <laughs> <No>. Ew. <laughs> I oh. mean, oh, the butt sweats, man. Does, <laughs> does Nathan's detailing make a product to like decontaminate the seats from that? Yeah. Or? Uh, that'd be great if this is a virgin, a, a market you could enter. Yeah, I don't know if we've tapped into the <laughs> what swamp, if you have into swamp into swampy into nature. Of, <laughs> is that too much? <laughs> There goes the monetization. <laughs> oh, man. All the heat. I mean, y- you burn your ass. Like, you're going to get out and your cheeks are going to look like pieces of toast. Like, the, the <laughs> lines on the seat will be grill marks. <laughs> Flame broiled. Uh, hey, baby, I'm a butter. Your bread is going to be a <laughs> new pickup line. <laughs> like, oh this, my God. this. Ah. I was, I had to be very careful when I was searching for information on this to like not search for information on this. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I don't, I don't want to see. I mean, I who cares pictures. if you do it on your work computer, you own the business. <laughs> Who's going to come after you? I don't want to see these things. <laughs> I don't want to see the Corvette curmudgeon without his Corvette hat and shirt and shorts. And only, only his Corvette hat. That's only it. his Corvette oh, yeah. hat and new balance. Yeah. <laughs> Golly. What is the real point of Cannonball? Uh, well, for me, it's uh, I like the outlaw nature of it, and I I have a problem with authority. <laughs> um, so it's Crook kind County. of yes, exactly. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of a protest against uh, you know government overreach and telling me what I can and can't do, and also you know to prove that the speed limits are ridiculous speed limits these days i've said it before i said it the last time we we're here i mean speed limit right now on most interstates is the same that it was 50 years ago you know and people are driving around in 55 chevys you know with no seat belts on a bench seat going 70 miles an hour like you're telling me that we haven't come you know a little farther with car technology in the past 60 sure. 70 years I mean, you could drive any car, I think, made today at 100 miles an hour safely. Yeah, at least in relative safety to, to, to that comparison. I mean, have you tried to drive the speed limit? I mean, it's terrible. No, it's I, like, ha- no I haven't. <laughs> it's, it's like impossible. Like, how do you drive the speed limit? Like, I, it's, it's mind numbing. Like, I daydream. I'll fall asleep. Yeah. I, I, jo- I don't joke. I, I have a mild kick case of narcolepsy and so i will um that is the thing falling asleep right i think it's so. not the stealing things i don't anyway um no that's a kleptomaniac thank you <clears throat> um so i can't drive the speed limit because i'll fall asleep so if i'm driving faster and actually like paying attention going okay i have to watch out for this watch out for that and pay attention it'll help keep me awake but uh, i don't know i've never tried that excuse with the cop but it, it is legitimately true um but so like in the i feel like there's three eras of cannonball one was the first 30 years of cannonball where they were basically proving the legitimacy of the automobile and whether or not it could make it across country and and proving the need for interstate highways and then you had the protest against the 55 mile an hour speed limit and government overreach in the 70s when when brock yates did the, the the cannonball run um, but I think I've, I've danced around this to find out like what my real point of cannonball is. And, um, my protest is not necessarily against speed limits because I agree with speed limits for the average person because they suck at driving. Um, but it, it's against the entire notion that slow is safe. Um, and, and that's just not true. Like slow isn't safe. Skilled driving is safe and skilled has, you know, an a, a wide open, like it's an open ceiling, right? Um, because driving is a skill that is perishable and it's one that you're always learning. Um, I am not to the level of skill that I want to be. I'm continually improving. Um, but in general, focus, purposeful, 
purposeful drivers with proper training are safe at nearly any speed and and far, far safer than the average person who's just out there driving, thinking that they're okay because they've never encountered a situation that has tested their skills. Um, and, and, and I think only after people have all that proper, proper training is speeding actually safe, right? Like the notion that speed kills is true because if you add speed to a lack of training and a lack of awareness, then it's going to be a recipe for disaster. But if you put proper training uh, into the populace like Europe has and especially Germany, and then once people are trained, allow them to speed, I think that's the ultimate solution is you have responsible, trained, attentive drivers that don't have restrictions on them. And I think that's like what I'm about in terms of cannonball. Eduardo asked you, he said, tell the old man to talk about GTO number 3589. Oh boy, that, you know, Eduardo, that is a story that warms my heart. And it it probably is one of those ones where I'm going to have to do the real short story. But there was a guy that had a company called Motor Cars Masculine up in North Royalton, Ohio. And when I was a kid, I saw an ad in the Plain Dealer, the the Cleveland newspaper, that said you could rent a Ferrari 275 GTB, a 250 GTO, a 300 SL Gullwing, uh, uh, a, uh, a De Tomaso Mangusta, oh, uh, Maserati 3500 GT, uh, and and a host of other cars for like anywhere from thirteen to thirty dollars a day, and this was motor cars masculine. I hate the world that I live in. So now. so the God. thing is, this dude bought all these cars because he loved them, and he lived kind of like on a farm, and he had a big barn and everything, and he stored all these cars in the barn, but he left the GTO out on a trailer. I mean, literally for probably 20 or 30 years. And this car had been driven by Innes Ireland, and it was at the Bahama Speed Weeks. I mean, the car is a very famous car. It didn't win Le Mans or anything like that, but it was raced extensively and very successful and raced by some really great period drivers. And the dude left the car out on the trailer. So we were doing a road rally with a bunch of friends, and we had lunch up by a, a national park in Cleveland, up near where there was, and I where they were, and I had um, my 275 GTS, and my wife and I and our friend John, I said, well, shit, we're right by Joe Cortan's place. Why don't we go check out the GTO? Well, we had heard all the stories. The dude comes to the door with a shotgun and and was like just. He, he scared the shit out of everybody because he didn't want anyone to come around. Well, the long story short is, I said, well, the hell with it. And so we're driving up. My wife's sitting there on the center console, and Uncle John's bent over because he thinks that he's going to be aiming for him or something <laughs> like that. I go, John, you're such a wuss. Anyways, I get out of the car. I go up to the door. I knock on the door. And I said, uh, may I speak to Mr. Cortan? And so when he came to the door, he said, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you want? I said, Mr. Cortan, my name's David Nelson. I'm just really curious about one thing. And he goes, oh, you want to talk about the GTO? I go, no. I said, aren't you the guy that started Motor Cars Masculine about 20 years ago? And he goes, or 10 years ago, and he goes, yeah. And all of a sudden, he got a big smile on his face. And all of a sudden, we were good friends. And he's, I said, listen, I hate to bother you on a Sunday or Saturday, whatever it was. He goes, well, listen, you can come see me anytime. Here's my phone number. You call me and we'll get together. We spent the next two years getting together. And, you know, and admittedly, I was trying to buy the car. And at the very end of the day, to make a real long story short, we're sitting at Chi Chi's at Rockside Drive, and he'd call me, and I had a son that was four years old and one that was just born. He was a year old. And I'm sitting up there with Joe, and he goes, and we're in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark and the whole bit, and he goes, David, do you think I'm crazy? And I said, Joe, 
No, I don't think you're crazy, but I'll tell you what. The rest of the world does. Why the hell would you leave that GTO sitting on a trailer for 20 years? And the only reason I can say this now on this podcast, Doug, is because my dear friend Joe Cortan died about five or six years ago. But the short story is this. Joe said to me, David, everyone thinks I'm crazy because of that damn car. And he said, and I'll tell you what, there was a snowstorm about 15 years ago. And my little son went out of the house and he went to look at the cars in the barn. And he fell in the window well that was full of snow and broke his neck, suffocated and died. And he said, I have never, ever been able to forgive myself because if I didn't have these damn cars my son would still be alive and I say this with a very humble heart because it's absolutely true and I said well Joe listen what did your son think and he goes he always wanted to go to Notre Dame and I said well Joe tell you what let's work out a deal you sell the car we'll give an annuity to Notre Dame you make a memorial for your son and to this day that's there Fast forward six or eight years, I'm at the car show at Stan Hewitt with the old 212. This kid comes up to me, throws his arms around me, and I'm like, what the heck's going on here? And he looks at me and he goes, David, you don't remember me, do you? And I go, no. And he goes, I'm Joe Cortan's son. He said, I just wanted to thank you for helping my dad. He got rid of his demons because he blamed himself for my little brother's death and him and his wife, my mom, have been traveling the world ever since then, and he got his life back thanks to you. And you know what? All of a sudden, as far as I was concerned, that meant a hell of a lot more to me than a GTO or all the money in the world. And that's the short story. Sad but true. I don't know how to transition from that. <laughs> well, and so look, I'm, I'm sorry, but th this all no, transpired over two and a half years, so I did it in 10 minutes or whatever, you know, but it it was very touching for me as well, and it yeah. still is today. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Well, God bless Joe, and God bless his son. Yeah. Cheers to that. Cheers to that.